minus 20. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we all doing? Sam here, United People's TV. I'm sure you know what time it is. It's 10.03. Look at that rhyme. Look at that. We're here to speak about the Qatari bid. After confirmation last night from Sam Wallace and Tom Morgan from The Telegraph that the full bid from Qatar, well, Qatari bid, I think that's, we've got to try and be a little bit careful of trying to separate that. Well, it's it's a confusing situation. It's a rapidly developing situation. I've covered everything from every single angle. Last week, the idea of a Qatari takeover, it was kind of laughable because it was all to do with minority stakes. That's not the case anymore. After a big day of development yesterday, and I will cover it here this morning with you live and direct. Good morning to all of you. Who's down there in the comments? Angela, good morning to you. Danny, uh, Anthony, Ian, Josh, I can see you there. T, I can see you there. Robert, we've got Julie, we've got Paula, we've got Keith Thomas, or I can see you there as well. Uh, Nina, is it Nino? Nino. Gary Hodgkinson, um, Luca Mora, who's on Facebook? We've got Mohammed, we've got Anderson, we've got Stu Mass, we've got uh, George Day, and we've got Anthony. There's loads of you joining in, and I'm sure you all join in because this is just, this is one of the most significant weeks that we'll ha we've had in, well, we will have had in recent history. We're finally going to be finding out who is tabling a bid to take over Manchester United. Now, it was Ineos and it was Sir Jim Ratcliffe who came to the table first. And now it's a Qatari bid from the Qatar Investment Authority, QIA, who, of course, are separate. Well, that's the idea. Are they separate? Let's, we'll, we'll talk. We'll run through the whole article. Before I do kick off the show today, it is Tuesday, which means, of course, that it is podcast day. What I'll do is I'll drop the link down there for you. I want to say something quickly about the podcast. From next week, there'll be a few changes with the podcast to make the podcast even bigger and better. We're going to be switching to two podcasts a week instead of one podcast a week. Right now, there's just too many things to talk about in each podcast. That podcast there, we had to talk about Leeds Home, Leeds Away, the full takeover, all the links to Qatar and everything. And then the news broke from Sam Wallace whilst we were recording. So we covered that. And we had to cover a Barcelona preview. It's just too much to cover in one podcast. So that's why we're going to be switching it to two a week. And the the, the, the release day is also going to change. We should probably be switching, hopefully, to a Monday lunchtime release and a Friday lunchtime release. Currently, we release on Tuesday morning. This, this way, it's going to be out on Monday and Friday after the game of the weekend and after the Thursday games that we are playing currently. So look, if you do enjoy the podcast... It will make the world of difference. Honestly, if you go over there to Spotify and to Apple, take a couple of minutes out of your day and leave a five-star review. It will be a big, big help from you as a community if you can give that back to me. Uh, Ian, you're saying sounds like a good problem to have. Hey, look, it, it is, it's definitely a good problem to have, and it's not a problem. It's just we're switching it. I think it, we're going to have two shorter podcasts per week instead of one big bumper podcast. Should make for more concise listening. I think so, anyway. But here we are this morning, right? I covered this yesterday in a video. Uh, it was a report from Bloomberg Business that the, that the bid for Manchester United from Qatar was said to be imminent. And I covered all the angles, just like I've covered all the angles this whole way through. And then last night, we got the confirmation here. This is from Sam Wallace and from Tom Morgan from The Telegraph saying this, that Qatar will bid for Manchester United in its entirety, which is the first major thing to talk about this morning. Because still, we didn't know the full details about that structure. Would the bid be a minority bid? Would the bid come from Q Q QIA and Q Qatar Investment Authority or would have QSI have anything to do with it? No, it's going to be coming from Qatar Investment Authority. Let's read through this full article here from Sam Wallace, from Tom Morgan. There's also more to cover from Mike Keegan and another update from Tom Morgan. It's, it's, as I said, imagine I didn't do these shows every day. You, you, you could not keep up with the news. 
United news is just absolutely that's what happens when you're the biggest club in the world, right? It is absolutely mad. We need these shows every single morning to try and keep on top of everything that's going on. So I hope these shows do help you because they help me as well. <laughs> if I didn't have these shows, I wouldn't be able to keep on top of it. Let's run through the article here. A bid from Qatar Investment Authority to buy Manchester United in its entirety will come by the end of the week for the deadline set by the Rain Group. It marks a major development in the sale of United, which the Glazer family have put on the market for around £5 billion. It's not yet clear how Qatar would square the ownership of PSG and United with UEFA's rules banning multi-club ownership. And I will speak about that a little bit later. Qatar Investment Authority, look at that, look at the numbers involved here, is a $450 billion sovereign wealth fund that owns, among others, the Shard, Harrods. And look, it acquired PSG through the subsidiary Q at Qatar Sports Investment. Now, you'll remember that I covered, it was Adam Crafton, I believe, from The Athletic. Uh, he said that the QIA got in touch with him because it was in his athletic article where he wrote that Qatar Sports Investment was a subsidiary of Qatar Investment Authority. And they reached out and said, no, it's not. So they're definitely trying to create this degree of separation. And it's a big, big thing. And trust me, I'm going to cover this in a separate article, in a, in a conversation as we go through the show, because that's going to be the big thing, how they prove that there is separation. I can see quite a few of you down here in the comments asking about Elon Musk. I'll be covering the Elon Musk situation a little bit later in the show. <laughs> Look at him there. Barry's buzzing. Look, at he's so happy. He's so happy. <laughs> um, right, let's run through the full article. The Qatari state put on hold all discussions of bidding for either United or Liverpool uh, until they'd staged the World Cup. As things stand, there is no bid. Like, and as things stand, there is no bidder for United as powerful as the sovereign wealth fund from Qatar. And I think this is a big thing. Right. And, and we spoke about this in. In the podcast yesterday, because the, the story broke whilst we were live and recording. And it's such a. I'm going to cover it a little bit later in the show. I've got a couple of points I want to speak about, about the Glazers, about about state ownership, and about everything to do with it. But it's not a simple conversation. That's what I think. So anyway, there's a, there's a super chat there from somebody. I don't want to miss that. Red Smurf, what are you saying? You're saying oil me up. Well, I'm not sure I want to oil you up personally. You're saying get me the competent board. Um, Qatar against the suit. Are, are Qatar against Qatar? Are against it? I don't know what Qatar. That kind of semi doesn't really make sense, that comment. Um, if a Qatari takeover of Manchester United happened, they would definitely employ similar tactics to what Abu Dhabi did at City and bringing the right people in to work inside that club uh let me see what else is saying down there uh, as well as psg look at that investments elsewhere it doesn't really matter key detail here will be how qatar squares any takeover of united with uefa there will be no issue with qia passing the owners and directors test because they currently because no current club is owned by qatar the major hurdle to be cleared would be we know what that is now i'm going to continue and wait for this to develop even more before I do a separate video on on the on on the separation that's required, there's a video I'm definitely I've already been thinking about this. There's a video I'm going to do on what happened with Leipzig and Salzburg, because for me that's the big precedent. That's the thing I think that's driving Qatar's confidence that they can own PSG through QSI and own Manchester United through Q QIA. And tick all the boxes. I think the Leipzig and Salzburg situation is probably the, the most prevalent part of that conversation. Because obviously they're both under the Red Bull brand. But UEFA said that there's no one person who can influence both of those clubs at the same time. Now, I think the, the, the person of interest in this whole situation is Nasser al Khalifa, who is the chairman of QSI. The owner, the, the down as the owner of PSG? I don't actually know. Whether he's the chairman, he's also really high up on UEFA's board. It's that it's for me, he's the sort of the the central figure in all of this. And how because he is the only person, I believe, he's on the board of QIA and of QSI. 
Now, what do you, where do you stand on this Qatar situation? I think I ask this every day and I probably will ask this every single day because it's just it's not an easy conversation to have. But we've gone here from last week when Mike Keegan first came out with the story of a potential Qatari takeover. And we were like, where did that come from? And now here we are. What? Around about a week later and Qatar, the bid is coming in, in its entirety. I want you to let me know in the comments, right? Genuinely, do you think there's anybody else that can compete with a Qatari bid? Uh, don't don't just don't just shout yes or no in the comments. Maybe try and have a little th have a little think about it before you leave a comment. And uh, is there anybody who can financially compete with what they would bring to the table? Because it's really going to be a struggle, I think. Now you'll remember that interview I did with Nick with Nicholas McGeehan. I always refer back to it because that was at the very very beginning of it all, and I was. As a United fan, I'm sure plenty of you have gone through it as well. It's just, I I think it was at that point there when Dubai and the, and the conversation around Dubai, and look, Dubai, Dubai conversation has gone very, very quiet, isn't it? It was at that point that I realized, you know what? It feels like the most likely situation is going to be that Manchester United are bought by Middle Eastern state. At that point, it, it felt, the most likely. Here we are six, seven weeks later and we're seeing Qatar coming forward and Qatar leading the way. And I still stand by my opinion that I had six, seven weeks ago that it's the most likely scenario. I'm going to go down and read a few of your comments down there. I think there's another thing to bring this one up as well. And look at that, man. Everybody here this morning. We've got Amy, we've got Red Smurf and Anthony five, gifting five memberships each. Dons, Dons, Dons. And Donets, is that a thing? Donets? Or is everyone just a Don? I think everyone's just a Don. Thank you very much, everyone. And as I was, uh, so I'm, I'm in conversations, I'm bringing on, I think, a couple of graphic designers. I'm now working with someone on the podcast. Uh, what else have we got planned? Some short videos, going to be making more of them. It's cool. And some new merchandise as well. You're helping make this channel go up and up. So thank you to everyone in the community. I really, really, I really, honestly, I really appreciate it. Let me read a couple of these super chats out down here, and then I'll read some of your non-super chats as well. Don't just read super chats. Martin, you're saying, would the CEO and the football director stay on with the new owners or be moved on? If we're looking over here, I was going to bring this up later. I'm going to bring this up now. This is from Mike Keegan saying, look, a little bit more info on the Qatari United bid if they bid wins. They are not here to lose. They would evaluate all departments before making changes, and those there would be given the opportunity to impress and where investment is needed, it would be provided. Martin, my gut instinct is that there would not be that many survivors if a Qatari bid took over in terms of the people inside the board. You've got Andy O'Boyle, who's been brought in as sort of like deputy to John Murtaugh. You've got John Murtaugh there. Now, he might survive. Don't think Richard Arnold would. Um, just again, this, this is not, this is not based on anything. This is based on my personal opinion of, of looking from the outside in, right? I, I don't think any of them would feel their job is safe. It's just like, right, tomorrow you go into work, you find, oh, hello, you, you, your, your, your boss pulls you in. He goes, right. Okay. So the company has been sold to new owners. Immediately you're thinking, shit, my job's at risk. And that's exactly what every single member of that Manchester United board would be feeling. Their job is all, all it's all completely at risk. It's that, mate, Liam, wow, fuck. Liam, Jesus, man. Liam has joined a very, I don't know, I don't know what, I don't know how to describe it. Anybody who gives 50 memberships, it's, it, it's, it's unreal. It, blow, it, it blows me away. And also it helps it helps with doing the giveaways like yesterday. I, I I promised that giveaway yesterday and that giveaway is happening. I just haven't got it completely organized yet. But we are giving away two Club Wembley tickets to the final between Newcastle and United. Seriously gold dust those tickets. And Liam, big up to you, man. And obviously everybody who's helping this community grow and grow and grow is helping opportunities like that happen. But Liam, fucking hell, you, you are a don 
indeed that requires a little bit we're of gonna do it anyway we're gonna do it anyway we're gonna do it anyway we're gonna do it anyway Yes, Liam brings on a Barry. Mm -mm, Liam, thank you very much. The 50 gang. Needs to get like a special like, special bit of merchandise, I reckon, for that. That's what, I, that's what I think. Nick, you've joined as well. You don't want to miss out on the party. I don't blame you. It is absolutely, you definitely want to join in. <sighs> right. Let's move on to the next talking point here. And this is a... I think I agree with quite... The majority of you down here in that I think a few of you are saying that Saudi, a, a potential Saudi bid could um, go up against Qatar. I think you're completely right on that one. And I, I've, I've sort of maintained, my gut instinct has told me that if Qatar would be confident enough to find a way to own PSG and put in a bid for United, I think that would give precedent to Saudi Arabia going, well, if they can do it, we can probably do it. Now, maybe Qatar is set up a little bit better because they've got QSI and QIA. I'm sure there's another, it, and anybody can let me know in the comments, the Public Investment Fund, they're the people who uh, who own uh, Newcastle. Is there another sort of investment arm in Saudi Arabia in the same way that Qatar has got QSI and QIA? I don't know. Right, there's a couple of super chats. Not super chats, just normal chats. Stevie, you're saying, I believe everyone would choose moral ownership after 17 years of the Glazers. Ultimately, as fans, we have no choice in the matter, but it's our duty to keep whoever takes over accountable. Now, Stevie, we had a long old conversation about this on the podcast yesterday. And it's it's not just because it's we've had the Glazers, but in the same way that after Mike Ashley, Newcastle fans just looked out, like, that's why they, they probably overlooked some of the issues maybe they should have looked at with a little bit more scrutiny with Saudi Arabia because they were just moving away from Mike Ashley. And everything and everybody is just better than Mike Ashley. I know there's going to be a lot of United fans who fall into that category with the Glazers. And I'm going to, I could probably cover this now, actually. And I'll cover it a little bit later in the show. I want to have a little comment on the Glazers. And I'll, part of me will be exactly that. And part of you will be exactly that. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't scrutinize other areas. And I will scrutinize other areas. But ultimately, what I want from our new owners is what is best for Manchester United. We need to be, if we are going to become the best club in world football again, we can and we should and we should be. And how do we get there? We know what we need. We need around about somewhere in the region of one and a half to two billion pounds worth of infrastructure investment. And that's just getting in the front fucking door. That's a new stadium. That's a new training ground. In my opinion, that's probably a new stadium separately that the academy sides and the women's team can share as well. Building a whole infrastructure around it. It's not just about Old Trafford. It's more than that. And to do that, the level of, and scale of investment required is just insane. And that's why I, I, I struggle and I have struggled to look past any concept of Middle Eastern owners because I just don't know anybody who's going to have that same level of disposable income to compete with that. Uh, da, 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 da. Ross, you're saying Flex met some QIA at World Cup and confirmed they're serious. Well, that's, that's good for good for him, I suppose. Um, let me see. I'm going to read a few of your comments down here. Mainly, you're talking about money, infrastructure, squad, structure, and management. Siddharth, you're saying if the club is run properly, and it's okay for a Qatari takeover. Don't want any nonsense. Of... No, FFP won't happen. Uh, Bao mentioned this in the podcast this week, and it's completely true. What Manchester United realistically Manchester United don't need we need a sugar daddy in the first couple of years right in the idea of the massive investment because we've got to play catch up after years of no spending right you want to have a look at this this is what I was going to keep for later this is Premier League owner funding over the last 10 years from when Fergie left to 2021 have a little guess of where Manchester United are on this list. And I don't think you need to guess. Do, 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 do. That's Man City right at the top. Ah, there's United right at the fucking bottom. With 154 million, well, according to that. 
154 million leaving the club. This is why we are in the position that we are in. Because the owner investment, simply put, has just not been there. So we're playing catch up. And that's why we've got to spend so much on a stadium. That's why we've got to spend so much on a training ground and other infrastructure updates that should have happened bit by bit over these last 10, 15 years. It should have been 100 million here, 100 million there, keeping evolving it. And instead, we've got one huge bill to do now. And because of that, the scale of investment required at the beginning is ridiculous. You're talking, as I said, in a region of somewhere between one and a half, two billion pounds. And I don't know if... Let's take Qatar out of the equation, right? Let's take Saudi Arabia out of the equation, Dubai out of the equation. And let's say there's no Middle Eastern state interest in buying Manchester United. And let's say we're having conversations around Jim Ratcliffe and Ineos for all intents and purposes, Elon Musk um, and, well, just Elon Musk and everything else, Apple, Amazon, all those, right? For them to make a return on their investment, and they would want a return on their investment, and I do think that's quite an important part of all of this. Because, look, right, the numbers involved in Qatar, $450 billion sovereign wealth fund. If they bought Manchester United for what? $9 billion? That would be 2%. If they bought us for $9 billion, it will be 2% of the overall funding behind that QIA. Money is not their driving... A return on investment is not their driving desire. It's not going to be what measures success for them. Success for them is success. Success for them is the prestige of being associated with that success. They don't really care how much they pay for it. Whereas if it goes to, and this is just the truth, as I said, this is just the truth. Whereas if it goes to Elon Musk or uh, Jim Ratcliffe and any else or any, other, any others like that, they will want a return on their investment. They will want to put in X amount of billions and get X amount of billions out more. And for, though, for them to do that, given the scale, that, given the fact you've got to put 2 billion in to start with, they'd have to own United for a long old time before they got anything like a return on that investment. Uh, Oliver, genuinely, I can't really get my head around it. You look at the numbers and you're like, ah, that's wrong, that's a typo. But it's not. They could legitimately pay $9 billion for Manchester United and it be 2%. What's 2% of your annual wage? Say you're on 30 grand a year. <laughs> 2% is what? 600 quid? <laughs> That's the sort of scale of comparison. Have I got that wrong? 600 quid? I think it's 600 quid. Six grand would be 10. Ah, fuck it. Don't really matter. Not that much. I can't. I, I, I thought I was good at mental maths. I can't figure that out in my head. Either way, it's, it's scary, the amount of money. But this is obviously the big thing here. This is going to be the next part of this conversation. Because now that there's Qatari interest, I'm going to be covering it from all angles. Uh, I'm going to be... If, if, any, if anybody who's, who's a member, right, um, and you're in the Telegram chat and you want to help me out in this one, I'd love to get some of you involved. I need to start researching and start bringing the videos that we all need as a fan base. I need to speak to somebody who understands a bit more about QIA, about Qatar, about their ownership of PSG and get some insight into that. I need to do a video on Leipzig and Salzburg and how they managed to tick all the boxes for UEFA. Um, and it was 600. There we go. That's my point. So if you're on 30 grand a year and you're spending 2%, that's it is what 30 grand. I don't care. Either way, they've got a lot of dough. Right. Uh, Satman, you're saying you you prefer bought trophies over a healthy club. Manchester United don't need to buy trophies. 
Manchester United's revenues are nearly 700 million euros right now. The fact that our infrastructure is so fucking far behind is because the Glazers have siphoned money away from our club for that long. We've spent over, we've spent one point, was it $1.5 billion? There or thereabouts on interest repayments. Had the debt never existed, we could hypothetically have a new stadium already paid for by the club with the club's money. The fact that we are in this situation is a consequence of these dirty, dirty leeches. The Glazers, who, by the way, according to Samuel Luckhurst from the Manchester Evening News yesterday, well, I don't really know about that. He's saying that, look, they are still trying to explore the possibility of buying out their siblings. You remember what happened in the summer? They went to Apollo Investment, and we thought that the Glazers were going to Apollo Investment to look for investment for infrastructure. And instead, they were looking for investment to buy their fucking brothers and sisters out. Dirty. And of course, and that, that, that's coming off the back of sit, hearing this yesterday from The Athletic, saying that Manchester United's board is being kept in the dark and not, being, not receiving updates at all from Joel and Avram Glazer. Look, some people saying that you're questioning uh, Samuel Luckhurst. Look, you can question him all you want. But there is absolutely no doubt that the Glazers are snakes. The Glazers do not care about anything apart from themselves and how big their bank balance is. They are driven by that and they will happily stamp on anybody to get that. And had they not owned our club, had our club been in different hands and debt free since 2005, we would not be in this situation. But here we are. And it's it, this conversation around Qatar, right, is is two is is got two angles, two two elements. Number one, it's a consequence of 17 years of the Glazers owning our club and leaving us in this current financial situation where the investment scale is beyond most reasonable business people, unless you're Middle East. And number two. The landscape of football has changed significantly since the Glazers took over. Started with Abramovich and the oligarch money. Continued with City and Abu Dhabi. Leveled up, I think it's 2011, when Qatar and QSI bought PSG. And has only continued to increase and increase and increase. And Newcastle with Saudi, you know full well, it's come in... It's coming tenfold. And the, I just don't know how you... I, I, I don't know how you can expect a football club now in the modern game where football is, the landscape of football. I don't know how you compete at the very top for Champions Leagues and for Premier Leagues without that sort of financial muscle behind you. I just don't know how you do it. I really, really don't. Arsenal right now, they're doing it. So maybe you can do it. It's just, um, man, it's it's tough. Robert Donovan, good point down there. It's, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? All the, all the money that PSG and City have put in and they still haven't managed to win the Champions League. Interestingly enough, the um, Emir of Qatar is expected to be in Paris tonight as PSG take on Bayern Munich with the return of the Champions League. Obviously, he's not going to be questioned about it. No one's going to get anywhere bloody near him. But he's going to be there. I just found that part. I just found that part a little bit interesting. But this, I suppose, is going to be, as I said, th this is the next part. This is where I think our focus is going to be next week. Past this point on Friday, we'll know who these prospective new owners are going to be. But now we've got confirmation that a Qatari bid is going to follow Ineos and Sir Jim Ratcliffe. And I've spoken about, hey, look, as, as, uh, people, I can see it in the comments there, saying, how, how can you ignore the human rights issues in Qatar? I'm not, I'm not fucking ignoring them. I will be speaking about them. As we spoke about in the podcast, well, 
I'll leave that conversation for the podcast. Actually, I'm not going to be getting into that. But I'm co- I'm this week. I'm focusing on covering the news before I take a deeper dive into it. In the same way that I've done a deep dive into Jim Ratcliffe and his ownership of Nice, and I've scrutinized that, and I've said issues that may arise from that. I've scrutinized Dubai, and I will scrutinize others, including Qatar and anybody else who comes forward this week. Right. I will cover that. And there's only so there's only so there's only so much I want to say on that at this moment in time because this is continuing to develop. Uh what are the other stories? Oh yeah. Let me let me go down there. I'll try I'll try and pull a few a few of your comments up down here. Da, 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 da. Ollie, we you're saying look, the simple fact is not the simple fact is this. Whoever offers the Glazers the most money will become Manchester United's new owners. They would sell it to the devil if he gave them two more dollars than somebody else. That's the truth. They do not give a shit about giving United to the right stewards to make sure the club t- goes forward. And I've said this before as well, and I'm going to be doing a, a separate video on this. Manchester United fans, we, we, we need to have... Gary Neville's called it a manifesto. and Maybe manifesto is not the right word, but we need to have our five to 10 year vision of where our club should be and how we get there and we have to try and make these new owners not accountable to it, but we want to know what their five-year vision is, what their 10-year vision is. We want to know where they want to take us and what their process is going to be to get us there. City had to get turned turned in out. They got beaten eight fucking one by Middlesbrough the year that Abu Dhabi bought them. They had to build a club from the very bottom, and the amount of investment there was just insane. At United, all you need to do is build us a new stadium, build our infrastructure, and let us spend our money. You do both of those two things, and Man United can be back at the very, very top. So regardless of whether it's Qatari, Saudi, Jim Ratcliffe, Elon Musk, whoever the right new owner is for Manchester United has to be the best new owner, has to genuinely want and share that ambition of fans to get United back to the very, very top. Um, and of course, this is a conversation that we need to have because this, this happened yesterday. Elon Musk, his name getting thrown back into the mix. I imagine this is just a little, I imagine this is just a bit of Daily Mail guff. I can't see. I mean, Elon Musk has just spent 40 billion on Twitter, isn't he? And he's managed to take that down the pan. I don't think this Elon Musk situation, I think, remember, was it must have been like four or five weeks ago now where Elon Musk tweeted saying, I'm buying Manchester United. And everyone kind of shut their pants. And he goes, I'm only joking, man. I'm only joking. I don't know why he's Geordie, but he is. I don't think the Elon Musk situation is going to go much further than that. The thing that we still do not know about, um, which kind of worries me, is the US consortiums, right? Because there are multiple. And they have stayed behind the scenes they've stayed in the shadows they decided not to go public with their interest but there are multiple u.s consortium bids coming in and because of everything that's happened to this football club under american owners over these last 10 years and the lack of investment that's come under the glazers i think united fans probably look at the idea if i was to do a poll in fact i might even do this poll now have a little think about it. It's a good question I've come up with in my head, if I do say so myself. Which new owners would scare you? What's the right way to word this question? What would be the worst new owners for you? Middle Eastern state or a US consortium? I want you to let me know. Maybe, maybe that's, the, that's not the right way to describe that question, but you know what I'm trying to get at. Because of everything that's happened with the Glazers, we're all shit scared about the idea of going into another US consortium and going into another situation where it's just another version of the Glazers. And that is something that will terrify United fans because we've had 20 years of that. But on the other hand, there are definitely questions and concerns that we'd all should have 
and we all will talk about, about Middle Eastern ownership. Truth be told, there will not be a new owner that pleases everybody. I hate to be the bearer of bad news there. The, whoever is the new owner of Manchester United, I don't know whether they're going to be the protests on, on the scale of the Glazers in 2005. But we will not get a, a new set of owners who everybody loves. That's why I think. Now, an interesting, I'm going to head down to that poll in five minutes or so. Check out what your thoughts are here. But this was also from The Telegraph yesterday, saying that David Beckham has been approached to front Manchester United's takeover bids. This is what the story says. David Beckham has been asked to back various rival bids as a race for Manchester United hots up. In a sign, interested parties are readying themselves for a PR war. Ahead of Friday's soft deadline, the former England captain is among star names targeted for potential endorsements. Beckham had signaled at the start of the process he will be open to talks, having become increasingly active in football investment in recent years. As a result, Beckham was targeted several times. Uh, bidding teams regularly target blah, 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 blah. This is an interesting part down there. It is understood that Beckham has so far turned down all approaches and will not be attached to any offer, even if Qatar, who he works with in an ambassadorial role, have their offer accepted. So Telegraph reporting that David, and I'm sure there's going to be others that come forward. I think they also suggest that Sir Alex Ferguson might be might have been approached by somebody. And if, look, if you if you're if you have that much money, I think you kind of be foolish not to try and have that conversation with Fergie. But David Beckham was a, was an ambassador for Qatar during the World Cup, if I remember correctly sort of kept his mouth shut when he was out there and then spoke a little bit about it after. I wouldn't be surprised to see Beckham involved. And apparently he's turned down all approaches so far. Depends how deep that relationship goes with Qatar. But because he's an ambassador, was an ambassador for Qatar at the World Cup, you would imagine he wouldn't be involved in any other sort of, if there was any interest from Saudi or any interest from Dubai. Can't imagine that was going to happen. So if Beckham is going to do it from that side, it would be Qatar. But maybe Jim Ratcliffe and Ineos, they would be trying to have a conversation with him as well. It's an interesting one. I wouldn't be surprised to see Beckham being involved in some way, shape or form. Now, let me head down to this conversation that we're having here and this poll around who you feel would be. So there's 550 votes so far. Man, look at that. In it, a clause. What an absolute ledge. Gifted 10 memberships. Uh, Charles, Mickey, Lamin, Marcus, Mr. Gamer, uh, Kim, and Philip. Beyond Fitness, look at that. You've been gifted, mate. Thank you very much, dude. Uh, the fucking generosity. It's amazing. Really is amazing. I wish we could put just put this all in one pot and just buy United. Imagine that. Properly 50 plus one ownership. There have to be a lot more memberships given <laughs> if, we're, if we're gonna get to nine billion. <laughs> but look, 600 votes so far. And I, for want of a better way of describing that question, I said, who would be the worst new owners for you? And I said, if you're looking between a Middle Eastern state or a U.S. consortium right now, 75 percent of you. So we've had just over 600 votes. 75 percent of you feel that a U.S. consortium would be worse at Manchester United. And I don't. That's not a surprise. That's really not a surprise, given what's happened at this football club for for nigh on 20 years now, under the Glazers. The idea of getting out of bed with the Glazers to get in with some more Glazers, that's definitely the worst case scenario. Whether you can have moral concerns and questions. Yes, we will have those. Just like you would have them with any owner. I've, I've said this as well. There really isn't a good billionaire. It's the concept of a billionaire. So it is the concept of capitalism. Capitalism is where the big man swallows the little man and goes around gobbling up and swallowing all the little men until the big man is bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you're all competing against the man. That's that's what capitalism is. That's how billionaires are created. Realistically, there aren't exactly many or any good billionaires. Uh, da, 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 da. there should be an option for both says media and advertisement 
I mean, you can say that. If, I, look, as, I suppose you can throw. You could say that uh, Jim Ratcliffe wouldn't be part of either of those, which I think is kind of a fair point. Claude, you're saying excellent channel. All credited to the work you're doing. Thank you very much, dude. As I said, that generosity is amazing. It really, really, really is fantastic. I fucking love this community. I think I'm really looking forward to doing this video. If I'm being completely honest, I think this is such an important point and conversation. How do they figure out that structure? I think what I would say is I don't even think it would have gone this far with Qatar actually coming, well, Qatari private investors coming forward to put in a bid for Manchester United. I don't think it would have come this far if they weren't confident that they could get around get around these rules if they could structure it in such a way that rules were not broken. I don't think it would have reached this point, personally. And given that they've got QIA and they've got QSI and they can create a degree of separation, I don't think they'll struggle for that. So I don't think it's going to be too much of an issue. I'm going to go down here and read a few of your comments, all right? Uh, Tibogo, you're saying, Sam, just tell us who you think would be the best donor. I'm keep, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping that separate, certainly for, for the point I, I'm just trying to present everything. I'll, I'll let my opinion be known full well. And I probably have over the course of a few videos already anyway. Uh, but I'm trying to read more about what you're saying as a community here. Um, did, 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 did. This is how the Super League will be a reality without having to formalise it. The smaller teams will not be able to compete and the Premier League will be weakened overall. I mean, it's, it's happened for a long time now, man. It's happened to United. We've had to sit here and watch City win four out of five and not being able to do a thing about it. That's the way that modern football has gone. And that's that, that's that's my biggest gripe and, and anger towards all of this is I fucking wish it, I wish it hadn't. But it has. And there is no turning back from that. It's At no point will all 20 teams in the Premier League be owned in the same way that they were owned previously. It's just not happened. The Premier League is too big. And it's grown into this behemoth. And the money required to compete at the very, very top is not what it was before. I, I, I always repeat this. Fucking Nottingham Forest nearly spent 200 million when they got promoted last year. And they're still in a relegation scrap. That's the money you got to spend to not, <laughs> to not get relegated. Give over. Cameron, you're saying, morning. Uh, do you know if the deal includes a stadium and training? We don't know the structure of this bid yet. We don't know the size of the bid. We don't know the structure of it. How much will be up front? How much will be, you know, in the same way that Chelsea was sold for four and a half billion, I think, there are thereabouts. But about 1.52 billion of that was was a pledge of investment inside a new stadium and inside the surrounding areas. Let me see what you're saying down here. Uh, Buddy saying you've got all faith in Jim Ratcliffe. I'll be honest. The I know full well. I know full well that the debt refinancing with Goldman Sachs would. And it isn't the same as the Glazers. And it would take the debt off Manchester United's books. But it would still leave debt associated with Manchester United indirectly. And that, for me, I've got big fucking concerns. Because I think I've, I think I've made this quite, quite clear to a lot of you. I'll make it clear right now. For me, the single most important thing when it comes to the right new owners of Manchester United, for me, the most important thing is making sure that Manchester United become a debt-free football club again. That's that's number one on my list. It's always been number one on my list and always will be number one on my list. Because when this football club can truly be self-sustainable again, and we've got the right facilities and all that in place, and that, that will definitely take investment, but we can just compete without having an influx of sponsors from left, right and centre. Oh, we've already got nearly 700 million euros a year. For me, that's the number one making sure we're debt-free again. And I'm sure there'll be quite a few that agree, but maybe some of you disagree. What would be... If you, you let me know in the comments. I'll try and read a few of yours out. Put it down. Number one, what would be the number one thing that you would say is the most important thing that comes with these new owners? 
if they're going to be the right new owners for this football club. Mohamed, you're saying, imagine how Old Trafford would look after Qatar Bias and Carrington and the squad. I mean, I suppose you've only got to look at what's happened at Man City. You've only got to look at, yeah, uh, the, they've transformed a championship level team effectively into perennial Premier League winners. Well, until this year, anyway, hopefully. Let me go down here and see what you're saying. Now, uh, Sky Sports, by the way, they're only covering everything that was written in the Daily Mail. They're not covering them themselves. Um, did, 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 spending correctly, Sam Wise is a big important point. United, but it's not as if it's not as if spending has been the issue on transfers overall over these last 10, 15 years. It's just we've spent that money drunk. I've told you. It's just like, I don't know, getting absolutely off your face and then going into a supermarket because you're hungry. You're just going to be like, I don't know, just shove that in there. What's that? I don't even, I don't even like that. Go on in. That's what United have been doing in the transfer market for years and years and years. Um, Derek, you're saying, let's face it, we want owners who will put money into the club, whoever it will be. Yeah, that's obviously an important point. Chris, you're saying it's a case of damned if you do, damned if you don't. And as I said, there will not be a new owner that comes in that is welcomed with open arms and a parade and I oh, woo from everybody. It won't happen. That's that, 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 that does not exist. Uh, did, 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 what we're saying down here. Uh, somebody made a really good point about PSG and Killian. We we won't be doing that. We won't be spending 200 mil on, on Neymar. We don't need to do mad shit like that. We don't. And that's what I mean. We need to have the right football people in control of our club. Our club is not in a position where we need to do that. We need to be smart about it. Yes, we're going to need to go and get a good striker out. We don't need to go and break, do the sorts of transfers that transform the market for everybody. That Neymar transfer and the Mbappe transfers spiked the whole market for everyone. Enzo Fernandez going to Chelsea in January has spiked the market for midfielders in the summer. We don't need to do mad shit like that if we're smart about it. Let me see in that. Guardian are reporting that Qatar are offering more than four. Uh, as I said, we go back to this point here. We'll pull up this number. We'll highlight that. And we'll say it really doesn't fucking matter how much they want to, how much they get charged. They can afford it. They absolutely can afford it. I wouldn't say Jim uh, Radcliffe was dragging his feet. Uh, he was the first person to say he was interested in a bid. Ineos were the first people to formalize that bid. I think just the whole conversations behind the scenes were how he was going to finance that bid with the banks. Um, John, well, I think that's a very good point there. It's going to take government involvement. If ultimately, I mean, that is ultimately the dream. The, the, the thing that it feels like it's kind of slipping through our fingers, I suppose. It never really was in our grip in the Premier League and the German business model, well, German football ownership model, 50 plus one, means that 50% plus one of a club is always held inside fan ownership. So even if there's somebody who owns, Qatar State owns 49%, they don't have the overall say of what the future of that football club is because it's out of their responsibility. Uh, and that comes down to legislation, the government white papers on football ownership, the Premier League. I think I've seen Kieran Maguire speaking about it since it's completely true. The, the timing of the Premier League charging City in the same week that the Premier League was supposed to be releasing its white paper on bringing in an independent regulator was probably no coincidence. Probably wasn't. Let me see what you're saying down here about what you think the most important thing for the new owners of Manchester United to do. Um, Andrew's saying, gee, it, it, that goes, look, Andrew, I've already said this. Uh, I don't know why you're getting so damn angry. If Ineos take on an 800 million loan, it clears the books for Manchester United. That debt is theirs. They're liable for it. What if the fucking market crashes? What if all of a sudden their interest rates triple? Hmm. You think that might then affect their decision making process at Manchester United? Of course it will. They will have an eight hundred million pounds debt that they took on because they bought Manchester United. Therefore, if all of a sudden servicing that debt for them becomes a lot more expensive, they might have to turn a couple of notches down elsewhere, such as with Manchester United. Don't be a fool in that sense. I know it would clear the debt off the books but it's still associated with... Cool, if you want to say it's not associated, you do you, you, do you my friend. Um, Kieran, you're saying clearing the debt 
Matt, you're saying first thing we need to do is invest in the stadium. Uh, Game of Beans, you're saying clear the debt. Quite a few of you are saying debt down there. Um, debt free, a new stadium and training ground, debt free. Uh, you will never spend uh, what well, you don't know about Manchester United's finances. Um, what are we saying down here? Debt, Carrington, fan engagement. Debt free, no question. Investment, true fan involvement, remove us. I presume, I think that we would, that would happen, wouldn't it? I think that's part of being, whoever buys us, we, we would get removed from the New York Stock Exchange. Everybody would get their shares paid out at a fixed price. And the Man United would then be a private company again. I think so. Um, a genuine love for the club and respect for the fans is a priority above everything. Now, Josh, I know you're very driven on this. I've seen quite a few of your comments. And I don't disagree. That's part of it. And it's a, it, it's a fundamental part of it for me as well. And it probably is why I'm sort of struggling with this whole situation. I'll, I'll be honest, the, the overwhelming majority of comments down here all surround the debt and the fact that we all want to become debt free again. Or you're saying um, most important thing is appointing the right people for the right job. No more jobs for the boys. And we've done that for too long. I think that's an important thing to say there is the structure behind the scenes. It's the one thing that City got right when it comes to running that football club and doing it correctly. They appointed the right people at the right time at the beginning and they benefited from that. So when Guardiola came in, it's like they'd been making a house for him in a bed for years. And he just sat in and goes, oh, that's comfortable. Yeah, that's comfortable. Uh, and Helmy, as I said, we don't need to do that. We don't need to inflate our books. All the inflation that City have done, all the success that they have had in these last, winning the Premier League in four of the five, last five years, and we've been a joke of a football club. Our revenues are still around about 30 million euros shorter, smaller than cities after everything they've done to inflate their books and winning multiple titles and competing for everything. And we've been a part of shit and our revenues are still nearly the same as cities. We won't have to do anything stupid like city did. We don't have to inflate numbers. Um, but yeah, we've seen down here. <sighs> Debt free and a top sporting investor. Clear the rust. Jeez, that'll be quite a lot. Da, 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 da. Mate, it's um, it's a mad time for United, isn't it? There's no other way to describe it. I, what was it? November, I think, when when the Glazers first came out with the uh, strategic investment alternatives that they were looking for. We didn't know that it was going to end up in this conversation. I think we kind of, back of your mind, you're like, fuck, Middle East and ownership could happen, couldn't it? And I had that conversation. Anybody who sort of um, wants to know my true feelings on Middle East and state ownership, I'll always refer them back to that conversation I had with Nick McGeehan at the time of Dubai. Because everything I wanted to say, I asked in that in that interview. So it's a really honest interview. It, it was sort of me as a, as a United fan not coming to terms with, but realizing shit. I think Middle Eastern ownership is the most likely case scenario out of all of this. I really do. I felt that six weeks ago. Here we are with Qatar coming in with their official bid. They're going to be in by Friday. Ineos are going to be in by Friday. We're definitely going to get the US consortiums. We don't know who yet, but there's definitely going to be US consortiums. And this, um, there's more to come, people. There's more to come. Well, I want to say quickly before we finish is I want to say, Liam, thank you so much, man, for joining the 50 gang. Or you're in that gang. Warren's in that gang. And there's, there's, a, there's a few more of you in that gang. I apologize for not naming the rest of you. So sometimes um, there's a lot going through my head in these live shows. Ramen, I absolutely want to do this. If anybody can help me find the right people, I want to speak to the right people then please uh, message me on Telegram. Maybe you can make a little group together. You can help me with the research and the right people to get in contact with. We need to make sure that we as a community cover this properly and you can help me do that by pointing me in the right directions. Um, dip, 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 dip. What are we saying down here? Matt, you need to stop with your random questions because <laughs> you keep somehow, you keep catching my attention. Yesterday it was about peas. 
yes bears or something yeah i think Gung, i think Gung is in that gang well he's definitely in that gang uh, over the course of time but look i will as you know by now i cover everything here on united people's tv i do a show mo monday to friday live and direct here at 10 a.m the podcast got released this morning there's two podcasts per week we're on tiktok we're on instagram we're on everywhere so if you can follow us Make sure you do. Make sure you subscribe here if you are new. Go listen to that podcast if you fancy it. It's nice for a walk. I'll be here live and direct tomorrow at 10 a.m. with some more big news. A big video going out today. All this conversation. And we haven't even mentioned Barcelona on Thursday. I'll be speaking about that in my video that's going out at lunchtime today. My starting 11 prediction. Thank you very much to everybody who is correctly, as Robert says down here, the best community on YouTube. It's that is 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 absolutely unbelievable. What's the poll results? Have a look down here. Fourteen hundred votes. Sixty four percent of you fear a um, Middle Eastern ownership. No, sorry, fear a U.S. consortium more than you fear a, a Middle Eastern ownership. And I say that's just sort of like once bitten, twice shy, right? It's because of the consequence of the glazes. And it's, oh man. Oh. Oh, 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 I don't know what I'm singing. Oh, man. You're a ledge. I always say, oh, one of the absolute OGs on this channel there at the very, very beginning with, with Ant and with Josh and the original mods that sort of first helped the community step up. Uh, always an absolute Don, man. Absolute legend of the channel, man. The whole chat is green. It is stupid. YouTube, there's no way that YouTube's got a community like this. Absolutely no way. The generosity from people to invite other people in is the greatest compliment that anybody's ever given this channel. Or you've done it today with Liam as well. Both of you, absolute. I need to make some like personalized merch. That's what I need to figure out. I'll write that down as, as, as a to-do list, man. Big up to everybody here. And I say there's, there's a cool comment down there from Isaac. Back in the day, eh, if 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 I I was chasing internships at all the newspapers after I got my journalism diploma, and nobody would give me a sniff, nobody would give me a chance. And I remember my old um, tutor at college at the, at the when I was doing the NCTJ course he said, "Oh, you never make a you never make a career out of a blog. What are you talking about?" Because that was at the time where this new media was emerging. All of you have helped me do this, and let's let, let's let's continue going right. We've all got questions that we want to ask in these next couple of weeks. If you help me find the right people, I'll bring that content to you and we can cover it all from the right aspects. So big up to all of you. What a community, man.